When people founded the antitrust, uh, 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 when they federalized antitrust power in 1890, you know, they talked about restraint of trade, but they understood that they understood the worker to be selling his or her labor. Yeah. So this was a sense of you know every single person benefits, every producer. Every every farmer who's bringing uh, a, a crop to market, every single uh, innovator who is bringing an idea to market, every single person who is bringing labor to market, we want to have open and competitive markets to ensure that nobody gets to dictate what we earn to us and that we have no bosses. We can pick up and leave walk across the street, walk down the way, and find a new person to sell our crop, our labor, or our idea to. That is what freedom is. How many times do you see local communities pledging away their tax base so that some big, you know, uh, uh, cartel or some, uh, you know, can come into their community, uh, always with the dangling the promise of jobs, and that is what we're being offered as opposed to fighting those big monopolists um, and saying, hey, we're going to create an environment where your own organic native talents can grow, where you can be creative and have low barriers to entry uh, for your ideas. Um, I kind of kind of felt like that is something we see even nowadays. Oh, absolutely. We're seeing it right now with Amazon. Amazon says, we're going to create a second headquarters. In this headquarters, we're going to employ, say, something like 30,000 people. So now what they have is just about every single city, every single town, every single state in this country is saying, well, we want your headquarters, your second headquarters here. And so now you see this race to give away things to Amazon so that uh, they will come to a particular place. Uh, so, th you know, this happens very much today. And it is a it's one of the things that makes it hard to concentrate power against the monopolists. Uh, but as you, you know, the key thing, again, is that what we want to do is like the way the political economy of the United States used to be structured uh, you know, following the principles of Brandeis and Wilson and FDR is that it is to, to put the individual citizen and the individual community first. The corporation exists to serve the public. The, the business corporation exists to serve the individual, not vice versa. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, you know, in this whole, you know, post, um, Citizens United world, you know, this is this corporation. Some corporations are a person with a whole lot more rights than any person I ever met walking around. So it's amazing. So, you know, our country actually did, you know, we're talking about like 1912, but we did develop a way to combat and confront monopoly and cartel. And you mentioned you invoked FDR and, and we actually were pretty good. You know, there was a case, I think you mentioned the A&P case, you know, where you know, we were kind of on the alert for, for the monopoly for a while. And uh, then things changed. Can you talk about the golden age of anti-monopoly enforcement in the United States a little bit? Yeah, I mean, the golden age, you know, we really had two golden ages. And uh, the first was in the early days of the Republic when things were kept small. And people kept them small because you didn't have major technologies linking up place and place. You didn't have railroads. You didn't have telegraph. You didn't have, well, now the Internet. So, um, so it was relatively easy to fight monopoly. Uh, the second, uh, in the second stage came in the t early 20th century, uh, in the mid 20th century, uh, when we were adjusting our laws to deal with the rise of the railroad and airplanes and the telephone and uh, these, these, these technologies that crushed space. And, uh, so uh, this took uh, the, this, it was essentially it was a second American Revolution because the, as we've talked about before the plutocrats during the Gilded Age had concentrated control in their own hands they had all the levers of power in this country in their own hands and the American people over the course of about twenty years broke the power of the plutocrats they broke the power of the corporate barons they broke the power of the giant bankers and financiers, and they returned the power to the people. 
And, uh, and that was what existed in this country. That was what, uh, was, that's how this country was run up until the early days of the Reagan administration. And that's when things really radically changed. Yeah. And, and, but then what, what happened during Reagan and who were some of the thought leaders that, that helped, helped to bring about the change? Yeah. So what happened in the, uh, and this is important for people to understand is, um, in the early days of the Reagan administration, uh, there was a bunch of folks who came from the Chicago School of Economics. And the, these people said, you know what? We've been using antitrust, anti-monopoly to protect our liberty. We've been using it to protect our democracy and our communities. Um, but you know what? This, it's inefficient the way we use our anti-monopoly. So we should change it so that we can promote greater efficiency in the creation of stuff. Uh, and they changed the, the philosophy behind our anti-monopoly laws. And they said, rather than serving the citizen, the interest of the citizen, and the citizen wants, what does the citizen want? The citizen wants liberty. The citizen wants democracy. They said, what we need to do is promote the interest of the consumer. And what does the consumer want? The consumer wants stuff. So they literally went in and crossed out the word citizen from the laws that we use to, uh, to protect us against monopoly. And they said, and they wrote in instead the word consumer, consumer welfare. And in doing that, they changed how all of this whole body of anti-monopoly law that we had developed over 200 years in this country, at a stroke, they changed the philosophy of how we enforce those laws, and they turned anti-monopoly law into a means to create monopoly. And, yeah, and, 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 and so what will have we seen since then? I mean, was Robert, because I understand, was one of the leading voices in this area. Uh, yes, Robert Bork uh, wrote a book. He published this book uh, called The Antitrust Paradox. He published it in 1978. And that was the book that the, the Chicago schoolers that the Reagan administration used to, as their primer, as their guide for overthrowing these laws that we had used to preserve our liberty and preserve our democracy for 200 years. And, um, uh, and Bork was, you, you know, he was, there were a few other folks that were in, engaged in, in, in that battle. There, there were actually some people, uh, just to be honest, there were some people from the, you know, there's, uh, the, the, the command, we could call it the command and control left who kind of, uh, said amen to that. Uh, but uh, actually, actually, there was a famous case, uh, in which, uh, the deciding opinion was actually the great uh, Justice Brennan, uh, who, uh, kind of use some judicial language to open the door for greater monopolization as well. Yeah, and, and the thing is, the important thing for people to understand is that laws uh, exist within a, a, a framework of, 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 of ideas. And that uh, you can take the same laws and you can use them in radically different ways depending on what kind of governing ideas you have in your head. And the thing about Chicago School libertarianism, it is a way of thinking that is designed to hide truth from you. Where, you know, instead of, you know, uh, for 200 years, people would uh, see, well, they've concentrated power. I see a fist in my face. What the Chicago School libertarian ideology is designed to do is to hide that fist mm. so behind something that they call the market. And, but the result is that for the last 35 years, we've seen the other side steadily concentrate more power in that fist. And that's the reality we face today is that on our side, there's a whole bunch of folks who are standing here ready to fight, but we don't quite know how. On the other side, they have a very fat, clenched fist. <laughs> 